Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron, I hope you're having an excellent day in Jesus. We have been journeying through the book of Genesis, and we're in Genesis 17 and 2. We're like journeying with Abraham here, okay? So Genesis 17 and 2, what's happened in the context, verse 1, where we ended last time, Abraham was 90 and 9, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, or the El Shaddai, walk before me and be thou perfect. Reminds me of 1 Corinthians 16, where it says, be perfect. You know, Paul says, be perfect. And then, so verse 2, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. So here, you've just had in the previous chapter, Abraham and Sarah concocting, you know, birthing an Ishmael, but it was not the seed of promise. It was blessed just because it was Abraham's seed, but it wasn't the seed of promise. So God comes back yet again at 99 years of old and said, I'm going to multiply your seed. Let's make a covenant together. Now, the cutting of the covenant, fascinating. A lot of great books. I think there's a wonderful book by Trumbull called The Blood Covenant. I need to review that sometime if I have it. And believe it or not, I know a lot of he doesn't don't like uh, E.W. Kenyon, but E.W. Kenyon's got an awesome book on the blood covenant, the exchange of gifts, and this type of thing. So I will multiply thee exceedingly. I'm going to multiply you a ton, and you know we all want that blessing of Abraham. Now, when you get to Galatians, Romans, the blessing of Abraham is the outpouring of the Holy Ghost on everybody. So that's the our exceeding great reward. So, and he's the Almighty God. We made notice of how in Revelation chapter one verses eight and eleven that Jesus is the Almighty. So Jesus is El Shaddai. All right, verse three, and Abram fell on his face. Now you see this often in scripture even to the point of angels like i tell you the one that gets me the most is john in the last part of revelation that he's seeing an angel and he falls on his face and starts to worship the angel john had been in the presence with the glory of god in flesh for three and a half years and yet he's still trying to worship an angel yeah not good but a lot of times when people are in the presence of god or that which is holy they fall on their face and so a lot of people use this to justify like passing out in the spirit or being slain in the spirit, maybe. But a ton of times you don't see him falling backwards. In scripture, you see him falling forward. All right. So Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, this is Elohim talking to him. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Now, this is just so fascinating because in the first, we're in the 17th chapter, You've got God speaking all in chapter 1, God speaking in chapter 2 of Genesis, chapter 3, you know, you've got God speaking to, uh, to the serpent, to Eve, to Adam, you, and you've got him speaking to angels, and you know, in Genesis 1, chapter 4, you've got him speaking to Cain, chapter 6, you've got him speaking, and 7, speaking to Noah, and uh, God speaking. This is just an amazing thing. And speech seems to be something that is a theme as well. Because in chapter 11, you have the confusion of tongues. Chapter 12, in the end of chapter 11, you have God telling Abram, speaking to him, get out of Ur the Chaldees. So God speak. This is just a big theme. And God's already spoke uh, more than once to Abram by this time. All right. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Now, you could either take that, the 12 tribes of Israel, and that each tribe would be likened to a nation, or you could take that as Paul does in like Romans 4, that the Gentiles are going to be saved through the fate of Abraham. And because out of his lineage, out of his seed, came Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so, father of many nations, that a lot of people are going to be saved from all over the world. Neither shall thy name any be any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So Abram meant high father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Some say he took the H in the exchange of the covenant out of his name. They like left it in there and gave it to Abraham and put the blessing. So high father to father of a multitude. That's another thing in the first several chapters of Genesis is the naming. 
Adam is naming the animals. Adam names his wife Eve. All the children of the genealogies, you know, chapter 5, are named. And so again, this is a very big deal. And so this is, it, goes, it harkens forward to Jesus' name, baptism, where you're named with Christ. You go down in Jesus' name, and you take on his name. So, uh, he's named Abraham for a father of many nations that I made thee. Verse 6, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. So I'm going to multiply thee exceedingly and make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. So you got to remember, he's 99. He has an 89 year old wife. And all he's got is from Hagar, Ishmael. And that's it. So God may promise you things that look impossible. But like Romans 4, we don't need to be weak in faith, but we need to give glory to God. That's what Abraham did when it looked impossible he just rejoiced in the promise of god and that's what god wants us to do as well so kings are going to come out of him and i will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a god unto thee and to thy seed after thee now this is why one reason you know christians really love israel so much because we would say just as romans 11 that God still loves Israel. And of course, they can come through the gospel of Jesus Christ right now, but to a large extent, their eyes are blinded. And just again, as uh, 2 Corinthians 3 through 5 talk about, and again, Romans 9 through 11, talk about this process. But at the same time as well, we have uh, that covenant as children of Abraham in the New Testament. That's Galatians, big theme in Galatians and Romans as well. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. So notice this is why there seems to be a physical Israel aspect, everlasting covenant, and a spiritual, because now he's talking about the land. And so this is the reason sometimes uh, Christians are seen as unjust, unjust to the plights of Palestinians and things. And it's because we're like, hey, Israel's back in their land. This is a fulfillment of promise. And it's pretty incredible. For an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And according to the book of Revelation, that's going to happen sometime in eternity future. Verse 9, And God said unto Abram, he keeps speaking, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which he shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. <coughs> Excuse me. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So the sign of the covenant was circumcision, shedding of blood, and uh, and you know that was where reproduction was, where the circumcision pr uh, process took place. I'm reminded of having our loins girt about with uh, truth in Ephesians chapter six. But blood, this is uh, circumcision, so it was the shedding of blood, and a particular, and so God in creation created mankind where they could be circumcised. Verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, for my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. Now why would the covenant be in Abraham's flesh and the people of Israel's flesh? Because God was going to become flesh and put the everlasting covenant in his flesh with the shedding of blood all right so there's amazing symbolism going on here and this is reason jews are still circumcised to this day it's also a tremendous proof that evolution and lamarckianism is not viable you don't inherit acquired characteristics because jews still have to get circumcised four thousand years later um, they never get to a point where they have don't have foreskin you know 
And so this is absolutely amazing. Verse 14, we're going to end with verse 14. It says, And the uncircumcised man, child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. So even if he is a seed of Abraham, but uncircumcised, he does not belong to the covenant. He's cut off. Cut off. See the notice the double entendre play on. It's cut off. So this is one of the many reasons that I don't believe in unconditional eternal security. It's not taught in Scripture. A lot other reasons more than this. But you could be a child of Abraham and lose your salvation if you were not circumcised. Notice it says they're eight days old when they're children, and it uh, that scientists tell us. When God created us, that's when vitamin K production is at its best, which leads to the coagulating of blood. So God kind of had this all planned out in uh, eternity past. Also, a lot of people would liken circumcision to baptism, and they would use this verse to say infant baptism is okay. The two are not congruent, first of all, because there's no New Testament example of it. So... That's for another time. We talked about it when we were in our journey through Romans. So, and when we get to Colossians, God willing, we'll talk about it more. God bless. Talk with you later in Jesus' name. Keep loving that word.